Well, welcome to our last session of eight, looking at the Shroud of Turin, which is reputed to be the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to do a quick overview, kind of get us thinking about this thing again, but then we'll be into new material real fast. We, of course, are talking about something used to bury just the Hebrew people. We spent half of our time on scientific materials, then part on the evidential method, part on the quadrilateral. I told you as of 2016, everything seems to be pointing toward being authentic or probably authentic. We spent time with the scientific method. We looked at the 10 elements of that and we kept getting various kinds of findings and things we learned about it in terms of what we saw and the damage that was done to the cloth by fire many years ago. And we found that the image is quite superficial to even threads. We learned about the method that they used for uh, whipping. And then of course, in crucifixion, how they nailed and the pain that they put the person through. And as they seesawed up and down in the technique crucifixion technique that was applied to shroud man in this case there were other crucifixion techniques that are not quite the same way and because the feet were nailed downward flat it forces the body to arch outward and has the maximum amount of pain being inflicted on the person talked about one of the first things i learned was the shall we say the autopsy and there have been 24 of them over the years of where people have been trying to explain what they see in terms of what happened to the body. We found out that the image that's on it is more like a radar than it is anything else. We found there's some DNA material, not a whole lot, but some. We looked at the flowers that are found at the microscopic level, pollens from the locations it's been in. We identified the wood that was used in the cross we found the soil that was in the shroud, which would suggest that's what was in the tomb. We dated the coins on the eyes, but then we had to admit that because they changed the, they stretched the cloth, if you will, that information can no longer be replicated. So it's possible we would want to discount that today. And then we looked at the things that post 550 AD, about the coins that have been based upon the shroud image and then the artwork that's been based upon the shroud image. We looked at the blood type as an AB, but then one of the most intriguing elements is to realize that the way the blood dried on the shroud, the body had to be within the shroud in two and a half hours, but it had to come out of the shroud in a way that to us is impossible to remove the body without breaking blood clots. And then, of course, we wanted to update you that carbon dating, yes, said it was more recent as a cloth, but the new shroud study group has come up with three different ways of dating threads. And when they applied their dating threads or dating techniques, they find that the cloth is actually old enough to be the one used by Jesus of Nazareth. One of the most intriguing parts that we ended up with was that the hypotheses that we've been able to generate have not been <laughs> uh, adequate to explain what we're seeing. And at this point, there is no single hypothesis that is sufficient to explain it. But we'll have an alternative in a sense. As of 20 years ago, somehow we were looking for something that would dematerialize the body and remove it without leaving evidence of any nature behind. We learned that there was another cloth and it was therefore like a replication that was used around the head and it's had its own scientific investigation. And in fact, the elements about it, about the discharge through the nose, that happens at three times and the, the timing is figured out. All that is such that it works within all the framework of the blood clot intervals. 
in terms of the other things that we know about what's supposed to have happened between 3 p.m. and 5.30 on the day of the crucifixion. The current alternative hypothesis could be a partial one. And that's called a corona discharge. And in this one, the Shroud study group is saying, apparently the body has done something that's beyond science as we currently understand it. And here you see one of their statements in where they give a fair amount of discussion. This is just one element out of it. But they, they followed it up in the sense that they did a, a study with a mannequin. And while it's only partial size, you can estimate from that that if, if you had 900,000 bolts, you might get the same corona discharge that's involved here, and you might get some kind of an image formation, something like you see at the bottom. I told you that in 2002, the owner of the shroud, the Roman Catholic Church, decided to change its appearance to conserve it. And it's no longer rolled up and in a casket, but it's flat now, and it's in 99.5% argon gas, hoping to stop the background from slowly turning um, a darker in appearance, and therefore eventually matching the appearance of the image itself. But when they did it, they had two different groups photograph at both sides. And that's when they realized that there's a faint image of a sort on the back side of the cloth. And so you have two images to explain any, any kind of uh, explanation you come up with. We then switched methods and all this is trying to answer a question, is the shroud man the same as Jesus of Nazareth? And in this one, of course, we're using a technique the courts and historians use because they don't use science directly. They use sometimes supplementally. But at any rate, if you wanted to answer the question, did Abraham Lincoln serve as our president? You, you'd use what I, I call the evidential method. Its issues are essentially the same as the science issues. And, and number two, and the list is a, a good example. Uh, when I was trained in science, we used amorality in science, but historians more likely would say impartiality. And of course, the justice system more likely say blind justice, but they're getting at the same kind of questions about what are we going to do with the facts and what facts are useful to explain what we're looking at. Some examples we took were all the materials because in the evidential method, you're looking at original resources, sources, a lot of reliability of them, the multiplicity of them, trying to decide is this valuable or not. Uh, I took some examples, and this one is by Josephus, the historian who included Jesus in his works. And so you'd be looking, in this case, does it fit with the other evidence, the time frame, and so forth that you would expect? if a historian had already written about all these kinds of events taking place. Having that as background, then we made a two panel historical picture in which we presented the five names that the shroud has had over its lifetime, starting off the image of Edessa, then Mandelian, eventually becoming head it was then called the Leary Shroud for a short period of time before it became the Shroud of Turin as we know it today. And then we started working our way through the various things that we could see in history elements. And then one of the first things was the question, who got the shroud after it was used in the tomb? Then following the original theory of Ian Wilson, we traced it to Odessa which is the first place it had documentation. And during its time there, it had the name both of Mandelian and the image of Edessa. Wilson's theory was it was doubled in four and it was hidden inside of a wide trellis pattern. And therefore for a thousand years, most of the people who were involved with it would only have seen the face within this 
a wide framework. We know it went to King Abgar. We know the scripture that's not part of our canon, but nonetheless, it's about this particular um, event. It was hidden over the city wall for almost 500 years. But our recent, I'm talking in the last 10 years, a recent coin collection studying has found that the Mandelian, in fact, is the shroud. It doesn't give us the proof of it. Because of the leg, the Russian Orthodox Church has, since the fifth century, had the bar that's on an angle on it. And that was because the concept was that Jesus was a lame man because of the way in which the one leg seemed shorter on the shroud because of the knee being up slightly. Well, they, they, once they started looking not just at the face of the coins, but they're looking at the whole body, that's when they realized they were seeing the withered leg on one side, which is exactly what you expect of a, the lame man approach. Council of Nicaea in 787 talks about the image of Edessa and it belonging to Jesus being sent to King Abgar like the scripture talks about. 550 is a major point because up to that time, all the artwork about Jesus showed him as a young person and showed him as beardless. But after that point, the shroud is the controlling thing for the appearance for the paintings thereafter. They don't always look quite so drab or negative or anything like that, but to, to any degree that they are, the, the characteristics are the same as you see it on the shroud. Of course, in 944, Constantinople had decided they wanted to have a power that was seen in the shroud at Edessa, where it protected the city. So they besieged the city of Edessa strictly to get the shroud and the copies and they took them to Constantinople for a while. We found in church history, it was known that Mandelian was a shroud of Christ long before Europe had it actually exposed at Leary. We learned that the first Holy Grail legend, which only lasted for a few years before it was replaced by other themes, was about the shroud. It ended up in the hands of the Knights Templar, and at one of their four named locations in 1945, a panel was found that had a painted shroud-like appearance. Well, after we talked about the shroud man as equal Jesus, then we switched to a different technique and we went, is Jesus the Christ? And this is, of course, beginning the part that I could not do in the high schools when I was doing this. But we talked about Wesley's quadrilateral and the various elements and how it was used. And we took example, uh, there are 39 of them, but we took this one uh, to help you remember what we did. The black um, type is showing Old Testament prophecies. Then in the blue type, you have Jesus making predictions. Then in the red type, you have the gospel recordings of what happened. And of course, you're seeing various images here of things that actually occurred that we can see from the shroud, or in this case, something geographic at Jerusalem. Or in this case, clear across the Mediterranean Sea, you have a historian writing who talks about the great darkness being visible over Rome, Athens, and other Mediterranean cities at the time when we understand from scripture there was a three-hour darkness before Jesus died. So we totaled up all these things, and while we're from an age in which we would do a statistical analysis, and I even showed you one, uh, Wesley was not inclined that way to it. Wesley, the scripture was the key and so he would say, since you don't have any conflicts among all these hundreds of things about the shroud and the sudarium and so forth, there would be no reason to reject what the scripture and the tradition has been teaching about Jesus, in fact, is the predicted Christ. Well, 
coming to finally new material, if you will. There's seven things that have been, shall we say, the basis of misunderstanding about the shroud. Of course, one of them is publicly, it was pretty much known only by the face in the Mandelian until about around 1100. It arrived in Europe in the 1300s from a discredited and secret source. There was a memorandum that appeared in 1902. It was about a bishop writing that he knew who the artist was who painted this thing. It took 98 years to have that memorandum shown to be false. Dr. McCrone in 1978 refused to deny scattered iron oxide and he quickly published his private website and uh, journal and so forth. The shroud was a result of artwork. Then carbon dating in 1988, we now know as of 2007, they dated an unsuitable sample. The sixth one, uh, sometimes this is a little bit more mm, nasty, but at any rate, some people who write books skip the evidence that's available. And if you do that, yeah, you can come up with all kinds of answers. And the last one is maybe a surprise. If you got a person to come to give you a speech about the shroud, the chances are they're going to spend time on a very limited scope of materials. For example, if you had Dr. John Jackson come, be a good choice, but he's not going to deal with the entire range of things that happen with the shroud. He's going to talk about the research that he's doing in Colorado, which is very good. But that, that said, maybe one of the few advantages I bring to what I'm doing with the shroud is that I'm not engaged in research. I'm trying to figure out a way to communicate it to people. And in that sense, uh, I can go for the full range. To wit, <clears throat> I begin a new one. This is the first time I will have done this. I've thought about this over the years, but the question is how to present it and also what should go in it. We all know in our hearts, if we think about it, that there's only one story that happened. We know that various gospel writers tried to say what they saw themselves, and they put it into their various gospels. And I have no complaints with that. They were talking to different audiences. They probably had different purposes. But none of them were trying to focus on the shroud and the sudarium as they talked. So what I'm trying to do here is to give you a quick illustrated story that includes these two pieces of cloth and how it would connect in. And I would imagine somewhere in here I've made a mistake, but uh, maybe you'll enjoy this. Uh, I'm skipping, of course, the parables. I'm skipping the teachings and lots of things along the way. I'm trying to make the storyline. And in this, I'm presenting our standard scripture in black. I'm going to put my additions in red, and then there are going to be some blue pieces, and I'll have to explain the background to when those happen to be involved. I start with when Peter makes his declaration that Jesus is the Christ, because to me, that's the point where Jesus can finally say, okay, I got them convinced enough. I can now go to Jerusalem and deal with the issues there. To the point, if they hadn't gotten themselves to this point of being able to make this declaration, Jesus and his entire group, to me, might well have uh, disappeared in history. But when Peter could say something that was sufficient to get him stoned to death for, <laughs> for what he had just said, I think Jesus was not ready to make his move to Jerusalem. So at any rate, now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus begins to tell the disciples that he's going there to die. And he gets two reactions. Peter, of course, gets real upset. Jesus has to rebuke him. 
But the one we call doubting Thomas says, well, then let's go along and die with him. We usually don't think of Thomas quite this way. Jesus then takes Peter, James, and John onto a high mountain, and he's transfigured before them, speaking with Moses and Elijah, the two great people in the Hebrew history up to that point. But when he comes down with them, he says, don't tell anyone until, of course, after, after I rise from the dead. They arrive at Bethany, at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and they're going to stay there for the Passover, or what we would call, of course, the Holy Week. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, depending on the year of Hebrews, arrive at Jerusalem to set up their booths and celebrate the annual Passover feast. This is probably the biggest feast issue they have. Jesus tells the disciples to go into Jerusalem and find a coat there that's never been written and tell the owner that Jesus needs it. And if you tell him that, he's going to let it come. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Jesus rides the colt into Jerusalem, claiming that he's coming as the king of peace. And of course, you know, he angers the high priest when he does this. Um, he says, well, you know, if, if, I, if they didn't cheer like this, the stones would cheer in, in their place. So there, the, the high priest is not real happy with what's happening here. During that week in the early part, Jesus curses an unfruitful fig tree, which withers during the day, and the disciples are amazed. He cleanses the temple after telling the priests that they've turned God's temple into a den of thieves, where they've had their exchange rate and gouged the people. So by this time, the disciples are feeling a lot better as Jesus seems to be showing the power they know he has as they're headed back each day out to Bethlehem. On other days, Jesus answers the trick questions about his authority and marriage in the afterlife and paying tribute to Caesar. So again, the disciples should be feeling pretty good. Everything seems to be going the right way. And I had one in here, Ananias, servant of King Abgar of Edessa, present for the Passover, observed Jesus curing physical illnesses. As they reach the midweek, the disciples are feeling great about how the week is going. Jesus seems in control. And there's a quiet period when everything seems well, but what they don't realize is that Judas Iscariot is setting up his plans to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. At Simon the leper's home for an evening meal, Jesus is anointed by Mary for his burial. And of course, the disciples complain about the value of money, that, which to them, they're, they're seeing it as something lost. Jesus sends Peter and John into the city to pick, uh, set up for the Passover meal. And they're to find a man carrying a water jar. Now imagine when this was said, they said, boy, this is going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. That day, only women carry water jars. So go in and it's, it's going to be easy to find this one. Well, I say the man's name is John Mark. He's the son of Mary, who has a larger home in Jerusalem. And today, the servant, Rhoda, apparently eats this Passover feast with her family instead of serving. Now, something about relationships. Mary owns the house. I have not found any evidence of a name of a man who might live there. John Mark is the son, and he's a cousin with Barnabas that we know. And of course, they are involved eventually in missionary work together. Rhoda is the servant. And there's a time we find later in the Gospels where Peter runs to Mary's house when he's escaping from prison. And Rhoda slammed the door in his face and left him standing outside. There's a room called the Cynical. It's probably 60 by 50 feet. It claims to be the upper room. It's totally reconstructed after the 70 AD destruction. I'm going to reject that as being the upper room. I'm going to give you several reasons for me rejecting it. First, it's built over the tomb of David, which seems like an odd place 
for Mary to have her house. Secondly, it's so big that it doesn't seem to work because the scripture says when they ate the meal of Passover, they were leaning on each other's breasts. The third thing, while cynical means a dining hall, there are going to be no slaves and no servants involved, as we will see. Fourth, a bishop in the fourth century, quoting second century materials, says Hadrian found the temple of God, this place, destroyed, while the house of God, which is Mary's place, a small cottage, as one of the few buildings still standing. The fifth thing, the room that I'm showing you, which we're going to call Mary's upper room, would require a narrow table and a narrow tablecloth. Sixth, this home and room are inside St. Mark's Monastery even today. And seventh, there's been a plaque claiming this to be the upper room at this place since the fifth century. So I've got a, a bunch of reasons why I think where I'm taking you is more likely to be true. I say the man, John Mark, in my opinion, leads them to Mary's room, maybe 24 by 14, where they eat on their elbows at very close spacing. You can see how they're reclined around the table. This is the best picture I could find of them reclining, but I don't think they're close enough together for the description of what I think happened in the upper room on the one that I would need if I could find it. Now, before I leave it, I do want you to see how they're sharing bowls around the table, two people to a bowl. This will become useful later on. I say that Joseph Arimathea brought to Mary's upper room an expensive, ritually clean, catch that word, ritually clean, 17-foot tablecloth for the Passover. Scripture is later going to say Joseph Arimathea bought a clean shroud. Well, why would he buy a ritually clean shroud for a dead body? The point of a tablecloth is to assure the people that there's no amount of leaven that can interfere with the Passover meal. So you see in my rectangle, I have a little itty bitty pile of leaven but I'm gonna cover it with my tablecloth. And so you don't have to worry about it and you can have a perfectly correct Passover. Jesus and the disciples walked in from Bethany after they had their complete Passover baths, getting ready for their Passover meal. But <laughs> Jesus and the rest of the disciples come to the upper room, re-soiling their feet in the streets. Remember, the streets were their sewers and their garbage disposal places. It was not a nice thing to come in. So when they get there, it's not going to be great on their feet. The meal will begin with Mary and John Mark serving the Passover meal. Rhoda is not serving tonight. Well, now here, no servants, no slaves, and no young child. Why is that important? Well, because... If you had slaves, they washed the feet of the people who got in from the street. Failing that, then you had the servant wash the feet. Failing that, the youngest kid in the family who was capable of washing the feet got the job. And why do I say that? Well, because scripture says the disciples squabble over who is the greatest. And I say it was to figure out who had to wash the feet. Because there was no servant, slaves, or anyone else to take care of them. Ah, of course, you know the outcome. Jesus washed their feet, giving them a lesson in how leaders serve others. And of course, you recall the story when it came to Peter. Peter said, are you going to wash my feet? Yes. You'll never wash my feet. Well, no, you can't have anything with me unless I wash your feet. So then, of course, Peter does what he always does. He says, well, then wash more of me. And Jesus says, no, I don't have to wash any more of you. You're fully clean if I just wash your feet. You've had your bath. Okay, so we can have Passover feast now. Judas Iscariot, 
leaves during the Passover meal. He meets with the high priest to collect his 30 pieces of silver. And toward the end of the regular Passover meal, Jesus institutes what we would call communion, Lord's Supper, Last Supper, Eucharist, or something. Jesus asked the disciples about how many swords they have, and they get the answers two. And he says, that is enough. The group leaves the upper room, and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane so Jesus can pray and await Judas and the guards. And I say that John Mark, now happy to get away from women's work, follows the men to the Garden of Gethsemane. Of course, Jesus goes to pray. The disciples sleep, even though he keeps waking them up, because they apparently just a little bit too much food, a little bit too late. Judas is carried arrives, kisses Jesus using the agreed signal, and Jesus is approached by the guards to arrest him. And Peter pulls a sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, servant of the high priest. And Jesus stops the fight. And he puts the ear back on Malchus. And I say that's to give the high priest one more opportunity to reconsider making this arrest. As the guards fight to get Jesus, a young man, I think it's John Mark, escapes by leaving naked without his garment. Well, if you can't fight, the disciples run, and I can understand that. Jesus is arrested, and he's now taken before the Sanhedrin. Now, Hebrew nighttime trial is forbidden, but they're going to do it anyhow. But they can't get witnesses to agree, and finally, Declaring Jesus guilty, the high priest tears his clothing. And that's supposed to be terrible news. As Jesus predicted, confronted in the courtyard, Peter denies he knows Jesus three times. This has to be changed in the Roman issues in order to get Jesus put to death. And Jesus is now taken to Pontius Pilate. Following a tradition of the festivals, Pontius Pilate gives the crowd a choice of criminal release between Jesus or Barabbas. And following the high priest, the crowd chooses Barabbas for release. Which raises the question of what to do with Jesus. Of course, you know the answer. Following the high priest, they answer crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And finally, Pontius Pilate gives in. So Jesus is mocked. I say he's whipped extra times. Based upon what we see on the shroud, he's beaten, he's crowned with thorns before him being led to Calvary. Weakened by that extra whipping, Jesus cannot carry his cross. So Simon of Cyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus, assists him. And I'm in one document pretty much suggesting that the son, Rufus, may well be the one who later became a bishop of Cyrene. Jesus is crucified. His clothes are taken by the soldiers uh, by gambling. Of course, it gets dark for three hours and the temple curtain splits when Jesus dies. Okay, relationships, who's at the cross? I think there are eight people present, and each of them have their th role that where they're going to play. His followers respond in five ways. Disciple John, who's to care for Mother Mary, stays with Mary at the cross. Joseph Arimathea goes to Pilate for permission to bury Jesus. And of course, the soldier has to confirm that he's dead by, by piercing Jesus' side. He could have broken the legs, but it wasn't necessary. Just the other way was sufficient. This means the sudarium had to be on Jesus' head by 3.30. Because about 3.35 seems to be the, getting close to the last point that would work in terms of the timing that we find on the sudarium. Nicodemus goes and gets 100 Roman pounds of spices to surround the body. And that number is good contrast. The fame teacher Gamaliel only got 80 pounds. 
Three women go to Jerusalem fields and they collect 28 flowers to place around the body inside the shroud in the tomb. And that's Salome, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Now, at this point, I would suggest you reach down on either side of yourself and get a hold of the chair, because this is, to me, where it gets exciting. Mm. I say John Mark goes to the upper room to get the 17-foot tablecloth. I know scripture says Joseph Arimathea buys a clean shroud, but I'm going to give you several reasons why I don't think that's what happened. First reason, Joseph Arimathea has too many tasks when you think about what's here. He has to walk to get permission. He has to walk back. He has to go get a sudarium quickly. He has to get it on the head. He has to get the body off the cross. He has to go buy a shroud. As the shops are closing for Passover, he has to transport the body. He has to put it in the tomb. He's a busy man. But on the other hand, if you use the tablecloth, it becomes a much more manageable list for him to try to accomplish. The second reason I would suggest the tablecloth is the sudarium is needed rather quickly to be on the head by 330 for a 335 punch in the chest. The third reason, the scripture never tells us who gets the sudarium. The fourth reason is the shroud and the sudarium are the same weave and texture. And if you look at the lengths of them, a 17-foot tablecloth would cover it. And what I think happened is John Mark cut the 17-foot tablecloth into five pieces, a shroud, a sudarium, and then the three strips that are needed for the jaw, the wrists, and the ankles. The fifth reason I think that's true, let me introduce you to the Turin Shroud Center of Colorado. We have Dr. John Jackson and his wife, Rebecca Jackson. Dr. John Jackson is the one who got the stirrup group organized in 1978. He's the one who got the photograph put into the VP8 image analyzer in the first place and found out it was radar rather than just being a photograph. His wife was of Jewish background. She's converted to the Roman Catholic Church. The two of them have followed up on this all these years. They are getting up in years, of course, like some of the rest of us. But at any rate, they are serious in trying to continue research work at the Shroud Center in Colorado. And their hypothesis that they put out in 1999 was that the shroud was first used as a tablecloth. And toward that end, this picture came with their material showing what they think the trails of food are like on the cloth. There were, they had the bowls, two people were sharing the bowls and they driggled the material out to where they were sitting. Now I know I have the pattern and bulk number and all that off. There's no reason to think I'm remotely close on that. But the idea you can see is that up and down this thing, two men or women were sharing bowls and driggling a little bit along the way. You, you might ask, well, how come the work in 1978 on the shroud didn't detect that sufficiently? Well, the problem was the hypotheses that they were using at the time they went to Turin in the first place were based upon trying to find out was it paint or not? They didn't have any hypotheses and they weren't looking for food related material when they were doing their testing. It's only more recently they realized, I think we're seeing these trails of food somehow. Could it ever happen that they get a chance to research this by 
resampling of the shroud? I doubt it. I doubt that the Roman Catholic Church, the owner of the shroud, is going to take it out of the argon gas for them to check to see if there happens to be food material driggled on it. So it's one of those things that if you don't have a hypothesis that would lead you to something, you might well overlook it. Who was at the meal? How many people? Well, I'm going to suggest there has to be at least 15. You'd have Jesus, 12 disciples. It was Mary's house and John Mark's house. But there could be other people present. And I'm naming four others just as examples. Matthias and Joseph Justice are the ones who are going to be the replacement disciple for G Judas Iscariot. And when they selected, they said, we're going to choose from the couple of who've been with us from the beginning. So who knows, maybe they were there. Joseph Arimathea, I think almost certainly was there. I think he brought the tablecloth. Nicodemus, good possibility. These last two are people who stood up for him in the Sanhedrin and did not want to convict him. But the scripture says they were leaning on each other's breasts as they were having the meal. I think this is a clue that maybe 15, maybe 19, some larger number was present around that table. Now there's a side question here. What would happen to the three long strips? The things you put around the jaw, the wrists and the ankles. I've been sticking my neck out a bunch here, haven't I? <laughs> I think you can agree on that. So I might as well stick it out just a little bit further. My theory is that if you went <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the tomb and you found the shroud and you found the sudarium and you kept those, you wouldn't throw those three pieces of cloth away. They're never mentioned in scripture in any form. So it isn't like we can say, oh, well, we know where they went. But I've got a theory, and it's strictly mine. I have uh, no way to quickly substantiate this. I think they were used for relic paintings. I think they were important enough that they were kept. And I've been intrigued over the years that the relics seem to run all the way out to the surrounding stuff around them. Now, I know in our, our way that we do pictures, we usually have white space around them, and we get real used to that. But my guess is they are close to the edges, and then the gold work comes over just enough to hold them in place. And we might well find that they, in fact, are those missing things. Now, could we test for it? Yeah, I have some tests in mind. If the cloth they're on are three to one herringbone weave, I'd say we have a good possibility that's exactly what happened. Of course, if it passed that, then you could say, well, is the soil on it of the travertine aragonite? Uh, is there any Jerusalem pollen? Uh, is there any blood type AB? <laughs> you might pull a thread from the corner where it's hidden and see with the new dating techniques. And of course, you might find partial flower or body images that could appear on it too. Now, this is just free. I'm not charging you any extra for what I have here, okay? Back to the story. Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus, of course, do the minimal burial work they can do. And the women are watching. And then, of course, they're going to have to put him in the tomb quick. But I say in the hurry to be done by 5.30, as required by uh, the church, the temple at that time, the body is placed slightly off center in the shroud. And this will become important later on. They do a quick prayer, they close the tomb by 5.30, they're out the door, everything's fine. Now, upon the high priest's request, Pilate allows four soldiers from the temple contingent to guard the tomb for three days. Because the, the, they asked to have some protection for this. 
and Pilate's soldiers and the official Roman seal are going to prove that the disciples did not steal the body of Jesus. And that's kind of like your Roman tax dollars at work. The disciples, of course, hide in the upper room. And I think around 2 a.m. on Sunday morning, there was something like a bolt of lightning in the tomb. And inside the tomb, at least a corona discharge, dematerialization, cloth collapse, with the resulting of encoding the images on coins, blood, flowers, all took place. Mm. And now we come to the point we actually have, shall we say, possibilities. Scripture talks about an angel rolling back the stone, scaring the guards to death. But it could actually be a lot simpler than that. It could be just the soldiers rolled the stone back. Either one would work because the important thing I need is that the soldiers have to know if the body is still there. Pontius Pilate's decree demands it. And if it's not there, then they should be put to death. So they're going to have to know one way or another. Now, one Roman Catholic author who's worked with the Shroud says he thinks this whole thing that we're used to reading in Scripture is really church dialogue, shall we say, code. The angel rolling the stone away means the disciples can't be arrested for whatever happened. Yeah, good point. And women seeing two angels in the tomb saying he is risen means they have seen angelic Jesus' images encoded on the shroud. Ooh, that's a whole different angle. And contrary to most writings about the shroud, I'm going to maintain that the images were known immediately, and you'll see why in a little while. Well, the soldiers rushed to Sanhedrin, where scripture tells us that, and I think they're trying to find a way to avoid the automatic death penalty for losing a dead body. The women, of course, come to finish the funeral task, and they're wondering who's going to roll the stone back, but they find it's already rolled back. The women find the body gone, but two claws at least, and maybe some more, if it's the bands are still there, uh, are, are still present. And, of course, the men, following common legal tradition, they don't trust the word of mere women. Sorry, gals. <laughs> Peter and John have to run and check. Because you, you remember the, the opinion or the word of a woman was not accepted in their courts. Now, again, sidetrack for a moment. The two great teachers of the Hebrew law are Hillel and Gamaliel. Hillel is dead. And Paul probably was taught by Gamaliel. Well, there's a gospel of Gamaliel. It's not the most wonderful gospel for me, but there's some elements to it that I think are helpful in what we're trying to do. Gamaliel's gospel says the high priest appears before Pilate, who first plans to expose this whole mess. And he's noting his wife's nightmares and his own nightmares. Now, we're not used to the idea, but in the Coptic Christian Church and the Ethiopian Christian Church, Pontius Pilate and his wife are both saints. She doesn't have a name in our Gospels, but they've given her a name over the year, as you see there. The high priest shows the risk of a popular rebellion if Pilate tells people he incorrectly killed the popular Jesus. So the four guard, as in our gospel, are allowed to live so that they can lie about the disciples stealing the body while they slept. And I'd say that the disciples not being arrested for breaking the Roman seal may be an indirect con confirmation that the guards did lie. But anyway, back to the gospel of Gamaliel. Pilate comes to the tomb with the high priest. And after some argument, Pilate gives the grave clothes to Malchus. And I say it's probably to get rid of the evidence. If they stole the body, you would expect the cloth to probably have been wrapped around the body and it to go too. So get that stuff out of there. But Malchus, healed by Jesus, 
of course, knows the entire story. And I say he gets the grave clothes to Joseph Arimathea. Now, it could be Nicodemus, but Joseph, well, it's his tomb. And he's the one who came and asked for the body in the first place. So I figure that's more likely to be the connection, but either of these two would actually work. Back to relationships. Now we're on the upper right area. We have two Marys. We have Mary, mother of Jesus, and Mary, wife of Cleopas. Now Jerome, in his writing, says these two Marys are sisters. But Hegesippus writes that these two Marys are sisters in law. Because in his view, Joseph and Cleopas are brothers. Um, I don't know about you, but it bothers me a little bit to think there are a couple of Marys in the same family. I would think that a little confusing. It, it kind of reminds me of a joke that I knew from many, many years ago. This will be the only joke tonight. Um, a census taker goes to a person's house and asks for the name of the man present, receives it, and the woman present receives it, and then starts to list the children and says, well, what's the name of your first child? Sam. Okay, writes it down. And what's the name of your second child? Sam. Uh, writes that one down. And what's the name of your next child? Sam. Uh, lady, how many children do you have? 17. How many of them are named Sam? All of them. Lady, why in the world would you name all of your children by the same first name? She says it's really it's pretty simple. When I have them to come for supper, I just stick my head out the door. And I yell, Sam, it's time to come for supper. And they all come. It's a great system. Uh, yeah, but what if you wanted a particular child? Oh, then I use the last name of their father. Okay, you got it? Well, I think Hegesippus is near, more likely to be true here. But in fact, these are sisters-in-law. They are not sisters. And this becomes important. The gospel continues by saying a man named Cleopas and his companion are walking home from Jerusalem to Emmaus when Jesus appears. Now, the typical image we have of this when we do this in church is like this, but I think it's Mary. At the cross, we have Mary, wife of Cleopas, and after this story, we have Cleopas and wife Mary. I think it's Mary. So I put a, a female face there, but I'm going to take one, one step further. I think he's speaking to Aunt Mary, uh, Uncle Cleopas, on the way to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And I think at Emmaus, Uncle Cleopas and Aunt Mary invite Jesus to stay for supper. And as he blesses the meal and breaks the bread, he disappears from their sight. And they rush back to the upper room to report to the disciples. And at the upper room, Mary's upper room, they're filled with every kind of emotion you can think of over the events that are unfolding during this day. They report that Jesus has already appeared in the upper room, going through the locked doors, but he ate a fish to assure him that he wasn't a ghost. Later, Jesus, of course, appears to the ten disciples and later to the one we call Doubting Thomas. Some days later, Jesus ascends to heaven, and they're told to wait and pray in the upper room. Some days later, the Holy Spirit comes upon the people in the upper room of Pentecost, and it looks like they have flames on them. Now, all this sounds familiar, I would think, to you at this moment. On the Hebrew festival of Pentecost, Peter preaches and 3,000 people become followers of the way. And I think that one of them was Ananias, servant of Agar of Edessa, who becomes a follower. 
Not too much later, Peter picks up the sudarium and wraps it over his head as he calls for the replacement for Judas Iscariot. And he uses dice. It's, they've cast lots. And jo Joseph Justice is not the one chosen. And so Peter places his hands on Matthias as the 12th disciple. And we basically never hear of Matthias again. Back to the Jacksons. Again, one of the things they're doing is beyond cloth study. They are looking into the rituals of the church. And it's in their view that from the very earliest, earliest time, the shroud played into what we think of as communion. From the earliest times, every communion used a white linen called corporal, which means shroud. Some of them even had shroud-like images of Jesus on them. The early altars had to be stoned because they were considered the tomb that went with this shroud. And think about what we do with this. We say, this is my body. This is my blood very impactful as to how this would have been presented. But the fact that all communions, it doesn't make a difference which of our denominations or Coptic or Ethiopian or whatever angle, they're all at the same point. To get them all to agree to anything is rather amazing. Despite the beatings, the disciples began preaching in the Jerusalem area. In a a subsequent visit to Jerusalem, Ananias attends a communion service with followers of the way. Gamaliel counsels the Sanhedrin to leave the Jesus followers alone and see if the group will disappear like the previous two uprisings. I'm guessing around 39 AD, Ananias seeks the shroud to cure Abgar of leprosy. So now repeating a slide, in the hurry to be done by 5.30, the body is placed slightly off center in the shroud. And so in Odessa, they cut five inches off one side and they sewed it on the other side to balance the image on the cloth. Shroud people have always wondered why the side seam existed. And I think it was to center it up so that then they could put the frame around it. And then they could put the coverings, which were common in the Parthian Empire. And so we had the Mandelian, once you uh, double it in four, as Wilson's theory explains. Ananias and Thaddeus, one of the 70 or 72 in some of the texts, present the Mandelian to Abgar, who then is cured. And of course, this is part of the scripture that we talked about. It's part of what the Council of Nicaea is aware of. But it was called Mandelian, even though it's the shroud doubled up. Of course, Thaddeus and the Mandelian never go back to Jerusalem. Maybe around 45 AD, Mary takes the Sudarium with her when she went with disciple John to Ephesus. And you see the top, the picture that is by tradition, her home for her last few years in Ephesus. And then after that, it appears that the Sudarium then went back to the monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem which is the complex that encloses within it Mary's upper room. So what we've accomplished is Jerusalem falls in 70 AD and the Shroud and Sudarium are both elsewhere, safe. End of story one, I'll give you story two. It's an entirely different one. It's my story. When I was a kid, I learned about the Bible stuff 
as a minister's son in much the way you would expect. But I also realized that not everyone agreed on everything. Some Bibles had more things in it than my Bible had. Some crosses, like the one you see here, had bars on that I wasn't familiar with. And I walked by a church, a Russian Orthodox church, uh, five times a week going to school. And I would keep seeing this and wondering about it. Well, I got to the point I went to college. And in college, I took a couple Bible things. And I have to admit, I was a lot like Doubting Thomas in some respects. I would like to have more knowledge. I would like to be clear. I'd like to be sure about things. And I had the advantage at the university that I worked at the university library and we had a closed stack system and you couldn't go to the books directly unless you happened to work there. So I had the advantage over a lot of students that they couldn't get to the books, but I could get to them. And when I was there and had free time, I could look at them and dig through them and so forth. So over my five years, I covered a lot of philosophy and religion books. And somewhere through there, I heard about a thing called the Fifth Gospel, the Shroud of Turin. Well, it was many years before I got around to it. It was 1978 that I started getting into the medical stuff and learning how the crucifixion took place. And I don't know whether Carol would remember it, but by the time I got that done, I was pretty convinced this, this stuff was right. Uh, I didn't have to learn a whole lot more, but I, I thought, yeah, 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 I think this is exactly what's right. But then, of course, 1978 is when they began the new science stuff under the Stirrup plan and leadership of the, I think it was 41 scientists. Over the years, they've published a lot of stuff. And that's when we got better photographs. We learned about the pollen. We learned about the soil. We found out it was radar material. I mean, it was a whole eye-opening thing that was completely different from the medical side that pretty much convinced me, yeah, it's got to be right. Of course, by this time, I taught in college the characteristics of science many times. So I know the value of replication where you kind of have something to agree. And by golly, the <laughs> Sudarium came up available and it had its own research and it seemed to fulfill neatly the replication purposes and the relationship between the two was pretty clear. Now, I don't wanna say that all this was simple and neat. Big question when I started was about the washing of the body. Was the body washed? And it was years before it was realized during the time I've been reading, that no, in a violent death, they didn't wash the body. So the blood, the way we see it on the shroud would be exactly what you would expect. Also during this time, we had this memo from the bishop, which now, of course, after 98 years, they finally figured out it's a fake. And so that issue finally goes away. And during this time, we've had, of course, the carbon dating. And the question is, how would it appear so young if it really was 2,000 years old? And of course, now, as of 2007, we know that they carbon dated the wrong thing. Of course, the hypothesis question has been an even bigger bear. What do you do with it if you can't figure out an answer to it as to what caused this to appear on this piece of cloth? Well, that hasn't gone away so quickly, but during this time, we've been learning all kinds of things historically. We finally figured out that it was in the Mandelian form for half of its life. We figured out that there are historical things with Abgar and over the uh, city walls. We figured out how the knights fit into it, the, even their paintings inside of a uh, uh, preceptory that was found in England. Even the Council of Nicaea was well aware of all of this, even found that there were scriptures associated with it. But still we're struggling this question, how do we explain it? What's the, what is the answer in terms of the explanation? And so it seems like more and more we have this question, could there be a miracle involved in it? Now, 
you and I probably both use the word miracle far too often. I mean, if you're going to the mall just before Christmas and you get a parking space right next to where you need it, you probably say, man, this is a miracle. And you probably would be right. But this is a little bit more involved. What would it take for this to be a miracle? And so one apostle question is, could you get the power coming from inside the body high enough to cause this image to have happened on the shroud? Could you get, shall we say, 900,000 volts to come from the body itself, not reflected, but come from the body itself? Is there any basis for thinking that might have happened? Or how would you explain the dematerialization? Could it be that you have a clue that somehow this shroud man was able to go through a, a locked door or something comparable uh, of changing the body. These are just some of the kinds of things that play into it. And of course, the Virgin of Guadalupe is kind of an interesting one of saying, yeah, we may have seen something of a miracle, something where 500 years before photography, the eyes photographs something and shows 14 people who were in a room when this thing was open and there it sat waiting for modern computers and optical scanning and so forth before we were able to see it. Well, finally, of course, the stir people are getting old. And so fortunately, a new group of men and women called the Shroud Study Group are now trying to figure out, 147 of them are trying to figure out what can they understand about this? And one of them that they've been working on is the corona discharge question. Of, that would answer most of the questions of what happened. It wouldn't explain how the body did it, but it would explain the effect of what the body did on the cloth that happened to surround it. And of course, then this recent thing of the coins and how it shows, yeah, in the fifth century, they saw the leg and the shroud and the Council of Nicaea, all this is logical because we've now got some kind of proof of it. And then, of course, the more recent question of the Colorado Center, could it be that our ritual really explains a lot of what's going on? And so when I come to communion on any given Sunday, I may not be seeing the stone altar. I may not be seeing images on the white cloth, but I may well be seeing that one of the very first things that came as a result of the shroud. And that, my friends, is fairly convincing for me. Not that I wasn't way back up at the medical side, but it seems that at each of the elements, I can see how all the parts are falling into place with no great problem. And, of course, this being a personal thing, while this may be my answer, it always comes down. Matthew 16, 15 asks you the question, well, then who do you say I am? We started with Peter. And once Peter could say, you are the Christ, then Jesus could start toward Jerusalem. And the question would be put back to you in much the same way. Well, I'm going to take it off of share at this point and see you people one more time in the regular way. Oh, I see some faces.